Well, if you would keep your Bibles open to this passage in Luke, I'm sorry, in, in Acts, written by Luke, in Acts, written by Luke, uh, easy to do, got Luke on the brain a lot. Um, we've been looking at expectations for our church. We talked about that last week. What expectations do you have for your church? We all have expectations. We talked last week about the importance of that. Um, we, we learned last week in the passage we looked at in Acts chapter 11 and Acts chapter 12, we saw that uh, faith identifies the difference between the way things appear on the outside and the reality of what's going on on the inside. So keep that in mind. The way things appear on the outside being different from the reality that's going on on the inside. Faith learns how to identify the difference between that. Now, in, in religious organizations, in churches, it's easy to, to just focus on behavior if you act right. You realize that's what a Pharisee is, right? A Pharisee is somebody, and Jesus talked to the Pharisees all the time in his day, who were very religious, very concerned about how things looked on the outside, the regulations, things they could observe. But Jesus said they were whitewashed tombs. Jesus says their hearts were filled with all sorts of wickedness. And Jesus called them out. Because all they did is look at people without a heart of faith. They didn't have eyes of faith. They would look at you as ex inspectors. They would inspect your life on the outside, and they would ignore the heart. And Jesus taught us very differently. Jesus said it's about the heart first. And so we've been learning about expectations. We've been learning about how things appear on the outside. But really what we have to do is look deep down inside of our hearts and find out the reality that's going on inside of us. Imagine how much better life would be if we stopped fixating on how things appear on the outside. Imagine how better life would be instead if we focused on how things are really going inside of here. Or instead of focusing on things that are going on out there, what if we focused on things that were going on in here? in the body of Christ at Maple Ridge. I mean, good behavior is important. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying the outside doesn't matter at all. It, is, it does matter. Good behavior is important. But sometimes people can get the impression that following Jesus is merely a self-improvement program through behavior modification. And that's not what it is. That's not what it is at all. Because following Jesus is a heart transformation. And it happens through the power of the Holy Spirit. And we're going to see that today. Today's passage in Acts chapter 13 is a passage that gives us a real-life example of what it looks like when we become a church that's driven from the inside out. We need to become followers of Jesus that are driven from the inside out, changed from the inside out. Jesus said the kingdom of God is within you. It's among you. It's the inside that God wants to change. So if you'd write this down in your outline as we go through this, if you would write down the slide, there it is, becoming inside-out followers of Jesus. And that, that just goes along with the Old Testament commandment. When Jesus was asked the question, what's the most important commandments? You know, commandments, the Ten Commandments. What's, what, what's the most important commandment? Jesus said there's two. If you boil it down, there's two. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's, it starts inside. Even in the Old Testament, we're, we're hitched to the Old Testament. We're, we're, Jesus hitches us to the Ten Commandments. He hitches us to the law. And then he says, you've heard it said, but I say to you, I'm going to transform it. You've just made it an outside appearance thing, and I'm going to make it a heart issue. He says, you love God first on the inside, and then on the outside, you can love others. Love God first, and others will come from that. It's an inside-out job. And so today in this passage in Acts, as we look at our scripture, we're going to see it's a turning point. In fact, it's, a, it's really a story of a confrontation. The apostle Paul, you're going to see, is going to call out somebody. And we understand what it means to call out somebody because you've heard it said, that, and it's very true, today we live in a call-out culture. People love to call each other out on social media. People's lives and reputations are ruined because of this call out culture. And what's interesting, what's interesting today is there's no back, there's no road to redemption, there's no way to get back and recover your reputation after it's been destroyed on social media. 
We live in a call-out culture. This passage is a passage of confrontation. And, and I want to take this call-out culture, this confrontation, and I want to apply it with an inside-out perspective. In other words, before we look at somebody else and try to take the speck out of their eye, let's call out ourselves. And let's take the logs out of our own hearts before we try to fix anything out. Let's make sure we do the inside-out principle. And you're going to see this today as we go through this. Would you write this down in your outline? Number one, we have to grow devotional habits from a spirit-filled heart. You're going to see that in verses 25 at the end of chapter 12, verse 25, and all the way through verse 3 of chapter 13. You're going to see that the church in Antioch that we've been looking at, this church was growing devotional habits, and they came from the heart. It was the inside. It wasn't just the practices on the outside. Things they did on the outside came from the heart, and you're going to see this. They took care of things inside of here. They took care of things inside of here before they could take care of anybody out there. And so it starts here. And we learned last week that there was a famine that was about to hit the Jerusalem area. And the church in Antioch sent people, they sent Saul and Barnabas with money, relief money in this famine to feed people in Jerusalem. And so they showed that they cared and they, they went and they did that. Look with me at verse 25. It says, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, the mission of famine relief, when Barnabas and Saul had finished their mission, they returned from Jerusalem, taking with them John, also called Mark. I mean, what Saul and Barnabas did was really messy. And you're going to see this when you start calling out your own heart, when you start looking at the things inside first, it's, real, it's very real life, and it's not easy to look at. It's so much easier to call out other people, isn't it? But to call ourselves out and confront the issues that are really going on inside of us and not just the appearance of things. Paul and, or Saul and Barnabas here, they demonstrate that they had a genuine love for God and they created, they, they, they cared for people who were created in God's image. They had this devotional habit of the heart of compassion. So would you write this down in your outline? Would you write, write down um, compa uh, cares for those in need? Cares for those in need that we know. Before we start thinking, we've got to go out and save the world, are we taking care of the people we know? Are there people within our own congregation who are hurting? That's why we have a benevolence fund, you know, to show God's love in a practical way through your own generosity that we take care of those that we know. When we have missionaries that we support around the world, are we taking care of them before we look to add others? And the question is yes. We always check in with our missionaries around the world before we take on new missionaries because we want to make sure that we're taking care of the needs of those we know. And so we have to do that. Care for the needs of those that we know. Do I care for those I know who are in need before I try to become a hero and save the world? That's an important question to ask ourselves. Look with me at verse 1 of chapter 13. It says, now in the church at Antioch there were, now notice this, prophets and teachers. Prophets and teachers. You might want to circle those two words in your Bible, prophets and teachers. Those are spiritual gifts in the New Testament church. And the Apostle Paul talks about the spiritual gifts frequently and how important they are to the church, to a local church, that people have spiritual gifts from the Holy Spirit. There, there are things that, that the Holy Spirit gives. There's gifts the Holy Spirit gives, and teaching and prophecy are two of those gifts. And notice the order that they're listed in. In verse 1, it says, prophets and then teachers. Would you write this down? The inside-out follower of Jesus exercises spiritual gifts to build the believer. The Apostle Paul says that these, these spiritual gifts are so important, he talks about it at length in the letter to the Corinthians. 
then the Corinthians loved the spiritual gifts. In fact, they had a disproportionate love for some gifts over the others, and they were into the gifts that were, that were miraculous and signs and like, wow, how did you learn to speak in tongues? And how did you do that miracle and that healing? And, and those are the things that they were just caught up in, and they were downplaying the gifts that benefited the whole church together when everybody was, was gathered together. And so Paul said, you know what? If you want to know what gifts to eagerly desire, 1 Corinthians chapter 14, eagerly desire eagerly desire the gift of prophecy. Prophecy. In other places, Paul writes that when it comes to the gifts that God has given the church, he lists the apostles first, and then he lists prophets. And not talking Old Testament prophets, we're talking New Testament gift of prophecy. And then teachers come after that. Now, teaching is important because it's information and it's about knowledge and we need to have good teachers that open up God's word and teach us what the Bible means, what these words mean. That it helps our minds, it helps connect the dots in our heads so that we can see how the Old Testament and New Testament are connected together. We need that. But prophecy is different because prophecy doesn't hit the mind, it hits the heart. A spirit-inspired word touches your heart. And sometimes a prophetic word comes in the middle of teaching. We see that happen on Sunday morning frequently where you're hearing God's word being taught and all of a sudden you feel like God's been speaking to you personally about something in your life. And it's nothing that I said. It's just the Holy Spirit is speaking to you. There's a prophetic word that's given at that moment. So you've recognized this. You've seen this. You thought that I was like a bug on your wall listening like some surveillance thing during your week. And I wasn't. I didn't know what was going on. But I'll tell you who did. That's a prophetic word that you're hearing. The church needs both prophets and teachers. And these people have to be in leadership in the church also. There's leaders that are listed in verse 1. Look at verse 1. We didn't finish verse 1. Verse 1 says, Now in the church in Antioch there were prophets and teachers, and then it starts listing them. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menaean who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, let me just take you through that list. I want you to notice something. Look at the list. Barnabas. We've already met him. He, he's the same Barnabas we've been looking at. He's, he means son of encouragement. That's what his name means. He's an encourager. And we've seen that he's generous. He's a big-hearted, generous guy. And he's Jewish. And he's from an island called Cyprus. Remember that. He's from an island called Cyprus. He's Jewish. And he wasn't born in Israel. He's a Hellenistic Jew. He grew up in a, a city, an island, where there was a Jewish population, but the vast majority were not. Barnabas. Look at Simeon. Simeon. He has a name. Niger. You've heard of the country Nigeria? He's from Africa. And it wasn't a slur. That's what he was known as. Simeon. From, look at the next name, Lucius. Lucius from Cyrene. Do you know where Cyrene is? North Africa. North, is, is a picture coming together in your mind? I want you to look at the leadership team of this church. They're from North Africa. Cyrene is in modern-day Libya. He's Libyan. He's not from Israel. And look at the next name, Manaean. What does it say about Manaean in parentheses there? It says that he's a childhood friend of King Herod that we've been looking at, the one who was eaten by worms. He grew up with nobility. Somehow he was in those social circles and he was moving. And we think that a lot of the information that Luke gathered as he was compiling his gospel and also the book of Acts came from Menaean, that it came from him. He had personal stories of what happened in Harold's childhood and in his household. By the way, this would make Menaean in his mid-60s. So there's an intergenerational component to this leadership team. Look at the next name, Saul. We know who Saul is. He's a highly educated Jewish man from Tarsus. Now note this. He's from the, the city of Tarsus. He's not from Israel. 
I'm repeating this again. He's not from Israel. He wasn't born there. So what do you notice about this list? It's a list of leaders in the church, and it was diverse. It was diverse racially. It was diverse socially. It was diverse intergenerationally. So the list of teachers and prophets demonstrates the diversity of the church. And so let's take this away. If we're going to be paying attention to what's going on in here, in here, in our, in our fellowship, and also in our hearts, we better say, are we welcoming of this kind of qualified, godly diversity? Do you know why that's an important spirit-filled habit? There's a prayer that we pray all the time as Christians. And that prayer goes something like this, that your kingdom would come and that your will would be done on earth as it is in heaven, on earth as it is in heaven. Do you realize how diverse heaven's going to be? Think about it. Put, put all this together in your mind. So as we reflect on God's heart we see that we're supposed to be a reflection of his heart on earth. See, Jesus gave his life to bring people from all nations together. And if we're going to go out into the world, before we start talking about going out into the world, we have to do a little calling out within the church, within our own heart, ask ourselves, are we welcoming of qualified godly leadership and diversity within the church? Because we're not going to have any credibility if we go out there, if we're not reflecting that in here first. Now, by the way, spiritual qualifications are very important, but the most important qualification for an elder in the New Testament epistles you may be surprised, is a good reputation with outsiders. When people think about what Maple Ridge Church stands for, if they meet a leader, an elder, a deacon from our church that you've appointed as a member of the congregation, they represent you out in the community. And if anybody in the community meets a person in leadership at our church and they go, ooh, they're a leader? I don't want to go to that church. That's a sign that person's not qualified. So good reputation is the number one quality because if we're not taking care of, if we're not calling stuff out in here, what right do we have to go out there and call them to come to? Plus, who would want to come to that? How attractive is that? Think about it. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 says, while they're worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Now, I want you to look at the word worshiping. Do you see that there? Uh, You might want to circle that in your Bible, the word worshiping. They were worshiping the Lord. They were worshiping the Lord, and they were doing it together. So inside-out followers of Jesus worship together. And that worship is essential to our mission. When we worship together, it's essential to our mission. Here, here's just a clarifier. We, we love supporting missions. We support many different missionaries. We try to do it strategically around the world. But, but let's just make this clear from this passage. Missions is not the most important thing we do together. Is not. Worship is. The reason missions exist is because worship doesn't. When we send missionaries, we are sending people out to win what? Worshippers. Worshippers. we got to take care of business inside of here. You see, think of it this way. If in heaven there's no outreach, there's no more missions once we get to heaven, but worship never ceases, then what needs to come first? Worship. Would you write this down in your outline? Would you write down that worship is the most important thing we do together. When we get together and we sing and we worship and we focus on the Lord and we have a message from Scripture and we pray together, that's the most important thing we do together. Everything else is secondary. To introduce people to Jesus, our goal is so that they can worship him too. 
Worship is the ultimate goal. Missions is just the method. I love the song we sang earlier today. We sang a song uh, called Shine on Us from Michael W. Smith. And he says, Lord, let, let your light, the light of your face shine on us that we may be saved, that we may go. But it has to shine here first before it can shine out there. Do you see that? We've sung about this already today. Before a bright light can go out there, it has to even be brighter in here. It starts with worship. In fact, the light that shines the farthest shines the brightest at home. Worship is the most important thing we do together. So we need to confront that issue of our heart, that worship is very important to our mission. Look at verse 2. I want you to see something else in verse 2 about an inside-out follower of Jesus. Verse 2 says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. Isn't that interesting? And fasting. While they were fasting, the Holy Spirit said. Now, fasting, there's lots of different ways you can look at fasting in Scripture. What it seems like here is they were fasting in a way to prepare their hearts to hear from God. They wanted to hear from God. They were seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And so they, together they said, let's fast. And I don't know what kind of fast. It doesn't say what kind of fast it was. But there was a fasting that took place within this church. And they were serious about seeking God. Would you write this down? The next thing in your outline, would you write down, seeks the guidance of the Holy Spirit together. An inside-out follower of Jesus seeks the guidance of the Holy Spirit. We do it together. Now, we don't know how Jesus spoke to them. We don't know if the Spirit spoke uh, with an audible voice, but for some, it was very clear, however it was, is he spoke. And here's what we, here's what we do know. They were serious about hearing from God. They were serious about hearing from God. They wanted to hear what the Lord was saying about what direction they need to go. It's the kind of praying that needs to be done before you launch out and do something big for God. Instead of jumping ahead of God and saying, we're going to do this for you, God, we take time. We say, God, would you speak to us? Would you speak to us as a congregation? Would you speak to me individually? Would you speak to our small group? Would you speak to, would you speak to, God, we need to hear from you. We're serious about this. We want the guidance of your spirit. And you see, they think about what Jesus did. What did Jesus do before he picked his 12 apostles? He spent an entire night in prayer. In prayer, in relationship, you seek a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's a relationship. Look at verse 2. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I have called them to. Verse 3. So after they had fasted and prayed, they placed their hands on them and sent them off. Wasn't that interesting? They just sent them off. When you listen to God like this and he speaks, don't be surprised when he calls you to sacrifice something you didn't think you were going to have to sacrifice. Do you see what they sacrificed here? Don't be surprised that when you say, God, speak to me, what is it you want from us? When we do that, that God would say to us, I'm going to ask something from you that you didn't expect. I'm going to ask you to separate from something you thought you couldn't live without. I want you to send out these two leaders, Saul and Barnabas. Oh, Lord, anybody but Saul and Barnabas, really. I mean, we've got lots of other people that are willing to go. Can you just keep them here? Keep them here, would you? Would you write this down? Obeying the promptings of the Holy Spirit. We need to obey the promptings of the Holy Spirit. So when we ask God to speak to us, and he does, we need to be listening to what he's saying. You see, this is why we need to tune our hearts and ears so that we can hear God in worship as we're together. We want to build hearts. We want to build hearts that don't just invite people to come in and worship, but but. Hearts that are tra transformed by worship so that our, our, we, we go out. We go out and we say, God, wherever you want to send me, whoever you want me to meet this week, whoever's path I'm supposed to cross, God, send me out this week. We come here as a filling station. We get filled. We get encouraged. We get instruction. We worship. We listen to the Holy Spirit. We get guidance. And then we say, now, Lord, send us out. Send us out wherever we're going to go this week. That's called obedience. And if God has been speaking to you and saying, I want you to do this, but you keep saying, I don't want to do that. But Lord, speak to me. I don't want to do that. 
you might be in a spiritual rut. And there might be one of the reasons things aren't moving forward, and I'm not going to try to diagnose it because I don't know your situation, but maybe you want to stop and think about this. If there's an area God's calling you to and the Holy Spirit's been speaking to you about, until you start obeying him in that area, do you really think he's going to tell you anything else? You're going to have to just keep repeating first grade over and over and over again. Inside-out followers. We seek guidance and worship, and we have diversity in our leadership, and the gifts of the Holy Spirit are here. And when we leave here, when we are sent out from here, when God says to us, I want you to take these two. By the way, can you imagine, again, imagine the two people that God said to send. God said, I want you to part with Saul and Barnabas. Now, what if we did that here? And what if the Lord said, I want Maple, I want Maple Ridge, I want you to send out Lloyd and Scott. Oh, well, Lord, you, you can't do that. Plus, Lloyd's like, no, that's not going to happen. I'm not going to go with Scott. <laughs> no, forget it. That's crazy. But, you know, when you think, well, what would happen? What would happen? That's what was happening to this church in Antioch. You lose two leaders like that. Who, where is it going to come from? Lord, those are the ones. Saul and Barnabas are the ones that were called to leave. That's obedience from, to the Holy Spirit. We have to do that, that confrontation internally. We have to talk about these inside-out issues. We have to do the inside before we do the outside. And the Holy Spirit is the one who sends his servants. And so in your outline, let's move to point two. Number two in your outline, if you'd write this down, is about spreading the message from a spirit-fueled heart, a heart that's fueled by the Holy Spirit. Look with me at verse four. Verse four says the two of them, that's Saul and Barnabas, sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia. Now, how do you pronounce all these things? I'm just going to do my best. Seleucia. And sailed from there to Cyprus. Now, by the way, this is the first of three missionary journeys in the book of Acts that are recorded. Three missionary journeys. I want you to see a map here. Here's a map of the journey that they went on. Back. Can you help me there? Go back. There we go. Thank you. This is, this is a map. I'm going to use the pointer up here. They left from Antioch right here, and they traveled by boat to this little island, this island called Cyprus. And this is where we're going to, this is the story. We left here. They sent. They went right here. This is where they're at right now, just so you can see a map. This is the first missionary. This entire journey, oh, wrong button. This entire journey is going to be taking, it's about 900 miles. It's a loop here. 900-mile loop, like a figure eight. And they come back. That's a 900-mile journey. And they move very quickly, you're going to see. And we're going to be moving through this entire journey with them. But this is the first leg of that journey. The next map is about that island Cyprus. The island Cyprus is right here. This is where they landed. They landed right here. And they took a road, and they ended up here. Now, guess who's from Cyprus? Barnabas. That's his home island. That's his hometown. And this is where you see the church starting to get organized and really intentional. Look with me at verse 4 in your Bibles. It says, the two of them sent on their way by the Holy Spirit, went down to Seleucia, and then sailed from there to Cyprus. Why did they go to Cyprus? Probably because that's where Barnabas was from. They were familiar with it. He had good contacts there. Cyprus was a great launching pad. If they wanted to go out into the world, if they wanted to reach other people, it was, there, was a, there was a Jewish population there that Barnabas grew up in, and so he was familiar with that Jewish population. They're, they're called the, the, the diaspora Jews there in the island. They were the dispersed Jew. They had left Jerusalem, and they were there. There was a big contingency of them, but it was a non-Jewish island. And so they, they knew if we're going to bring the gospel out, let's go to some place where we're familiar, and then let's from there launch out to go to people who don't know about the Old Testament and don't know about the coming Messiah. In fact, here's a word I want you to be familiar with. It's the word diaspora. Do you see that there? It's not in your outline, but I want you to be familiar with that word. You're going to hear it a couple times today, diaspora. And it's a dispersion of any people from their original homeland. Anybody who's from, and they, they get to where they're going and they huddle together. They form a community there. And so there's the diaspora Jewish people that Barnabas grew up with in Cyprus. 
And they, they came together, and what they did is they formed synagogues or little prayer houses where they could gather together, and they could teach their kids the ways of Judaism. They could teach the law. They could teach the Torah to their kids in their synagogues, and so they would do that. They little sprinkled diaspora communities throughout the area. Look at verse 5 in your Bible. Verse 5 says, when they arrived at Salemis, they proclaimed the word of God, where? In the Jewish synagogues. They went to the Jewish synagogues. You may, why, why would they do that? Why would they go to the synagogues? Here's why. They want to reach non-Jewish people. Here's what they thought. They knew this. There were non-Jewish people going to these synagogues. And they're gathered there. And so Saul and Barnabas, who were respected in their own, in their Judaism, and, and Saul and his training, they would go there to teach. They would use it as an opportunity to reach out. And they had common ground at the synagogue. Would you write this down in your outline? Would you write down, go to a place of common ground and openness. So they take this message to the diaspora Jewish community there, and, and they do. By the way, do you know that we have diaspora communities here in the Twin Cities? Think about this. You, it's in the news all the time. We have diaspora communities here. We have people who've been dispersed from their homelands and have settled here and huddled together. You know about them, don't you? Did you know that there's more than one and a half million Somalis who live outside of their homeland because of the conflict that's just ravaged their country since 1991? And did you know that uh, places like Sweden and Australia, Anchorage, Alaska, Columbus, and Ohio, they live in places like that, but you know the largest Somali community is right here in our own backyard? Did you know that? The diaspora Somali community, the dispersed Somalis, more than 100,000 make their home here in Minnesota. And did you know of those 100,000 that they estimate that only 34, 34 self-identify as followers of Jesus? Think about that. They're here. 75% of Somalis express a desire to follow Jesus, but when they do and they return... They return back to Islam when they go back to their home country because of the pressure that they feel. 75% turn away from any decisions they make to follow Jesus. The diaspora community. In the Twin Cities, there's another diaspora community. It's an immigrants who come. There's 3,500 from the, the Buddhist nation of Tibet. And did you know there's only, of the 3,500, there's only three, only three people self-identify as followers of Christ. And there's no Tibetan church in all of North America. There's no church that's reaching out to them. Only three. Did you know that Minnesota is the home to the largest Buddhist temple in North America? It's in Hampton, Minnesota, just south of Farmington. Did you know that? Did you know that uh, Minnesota also is the home to the largest Hindu, Hindu temple in North America? Do you know where that's located? Right here in Maple Grove in our own backyard. Largest in the nation. Diaspora communities who've come to our, the world is coming to our backyard. They are our neighbors. You know what Jesus said about your neighbor? You know the Phillips neighborhood in Minneapolis is said to be the most diverse neighborhood in the United States when it comes to the variety of languages spoken in the ethnicities that live there? Did you know that in that part of the, of the Minneapolis area, there's a neighborhood that has the highest urban concentration of Native Americans? They are now called First Nations people than any urban center in North America. 40,000, 40,000, but only 1% attend a church, only 1% attend a church. Diaspora, they've come to our backyard. They're here. So when you look at the map of Cyprus, I want you to understand we're living that world right now, whether you realize it or not. Did you know that the largest Ethiopian community outside of Ethiopia, the Ramo community, is here in the Twin Cities, upwards of 40,000 living in the northern suburbs of Minneapolis? Well, we are privileged today. I've asked Bruce and Judy Adamson, who are back here in the States. They are missionaries we've supported for years. And I've asked uh, if they could come here. Bruce is out of town right now. He's speaking this weekend in Montreal. But I've asked Julie if she would come. And, and Julie's going to come. And, and after Julie 
after, I know you have more blanks in your outline. We'll get to it. So this is still the sermon. This is still the sermon. We're still in the Word. But I want to stop the sermon, and we're going to keep, I, I want you to hear what God is doing through Bruce and Julie's ministry that God's called them from Africa here. Julie, let's welcome Julie to the platform. Well, um, there is a slide that I want to show here on the screen. Um, it's a statement, and it's a statement here, and I'm just going to be more of an interview as I talk to Julie. Uh, but this is the statement. You can read it there. It says, we're asking God for a gospel movement among every least reached people group in our generation. And so tell us about this transition that you and Bruce have been making from Senegal, West Africa, where you've been for 24 years, and now you're here back in the Twin Cities. So go ahead and share that with us. Well, a couple of years ago, um, Verge International Missions asked us to consider moving back here and uh, joining with local churches in um, outreach to the unreached diaspora here. And so this last July, we moved back from Senegal, and we are just so encouraged to be part of what God is doing here in the Twin Cities and other uh, cities in Minnesota, because God's already been orchestrating what he's doing, and he's just uh, bringing many people together to be better together as we reach out to these, these dear people. Because um, unlike in their homelands that are very close to the gospel, here we have many believers in our churches who love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And we love others. And we, um, we can be a, a really amazing missionary force in our own backyards. And so um, as we begin to um, meet our neighbors and love on them, we should be asking ourselves, what would it take for the gospel to take root in this particular people in this place? And you know, how can we take the gospel cross-culturally in our own city, to our neighbors, our coworkers, classmates, those around us. So this um, statement you see on the screen is a vision statement that informs everything we do in international missions with Converge. We are asking God for a gospel movement among every least reached people in our generation. Mm -hmm. So. No, keep going, yeah. keep going. I want, you to, I want Julie to take us through that statement you see on the screen, and I want her to, to break it down for us, because here's why I've asked Julie to talk to us. Yeah, God right. may be speaking to some of us about being involved with our neighbors, but we don't know how to start. Bruce and Julie have years of experience of building bridges and relationships into another culture that's right in our own backyard. And so if that's something God's been prompting you on and you want to find out about it, you're going to have a chance to talk with Julie uh, after the service in the lobby. But would you take us through this uh, phrase by phrase, like the part that says we're asking God. What does that mean, you're asking God? Yeah. Well, um, you know, that speaks to our utter dependency on God for this. Prayer mm -hmm. and fasting, as you were mentioning earlier, the work, the work of the Spirit is what needs to happen. Because we're re dealing with historically resistant people. They've been resistant in their homelands, and they're resistant here. These are places where the gospel light may have not been seen in centuries, and or if ever. So nothing is going to happen here without prayer and the work of the Spirit. Because by ourselves, we lack the wisdom. We lack the strength. We lack the open doors for his gospel message to come and be understood and believed. So, you know, we're, we move forward in obedience um, with very um, intentional strategies based on prayer. And we want to know what God's thoughts are on this because we want to do what he's doing, like be about what he's about. Yeah. And what's a gospel movement referred to? It says on the screen there, a gospel movement yeah. among every least. What's the gospel movement part? That uh, speaks more to a focus not on individuals here and there, but on people, um, natural networks, families. Um, you know, if an individual here or there comes to faith, generally they, they distance themselves from the family or they're even cut off, and that cuts off any momentum that could be gained. So, you know, when Jesus revealed himself to the Samaritan woman at the well, his plan was a lot bigger than just her. Her plan, his plan was that she would go back and share uh, who she had met with the rest of her village and that they could also know him. And when Jesus healed the Gerizim demoniac, this young man wanted to follow Jesus, 
But Jesus said, no, go back to your own people mm -hmm. and tell them what God has done for you. So we want to form strategies that will reach families, groups, that will gain momentum, that will multiply instead of merely addition, the addition. So and you, you mentioned earlier, this interaction here, this, this is something that these are, these are people who were maybe more resistant back in their home countries. But now through whatever circumstances, here they are. And there may be more of an openness. They're in a new situation, new surroundings. And they're right, they're, they've become our neighbors. And we talked earlier in the message about how heaven's going to be filled with people from every tribe and nation and tongue in the book of Revelation. And so these, are our, these, these can be potential brothers and sisters in Christ. And so when it says in that statement there, among the least reached people groups, just explain a little bit more about that. Yeah. You know, I love the song we sang earlier from Revelation about John when he saw uh, the throne room and before him was people from every nation, tribe, tongue, and language, and they were all um, saying, holy, holy, holy before the Lamb. I, I loved the harmony I heard as you sang that, and I was just thinking, could we add to that harmony all the languages of the world? So we're wanting to go to places that still don't have a voice around the throne, and we want to be strategic about reaching out to these people. Yeah, and you mentioned in this, in this last thing in that statement, it says, in our generation, which kind of talks to the urgency. There's something that we're in a unique time right now. There's a window we have. Would you speak to that? No, I think that's exactly true. It, there is a sense of urgency. Um, God has brought people here. The, they might think they're here because of war or famine or for jobs, but this is God's working. He works through migration. And so um, we all have a part. We've been brought into the kingdom, and out of our love for God and love for others, we want to share that with other people. So what does that have to do with us here in the, at Maple Grove, at Maple Ridge Church? Yeah. You know, um, I love this verse in, uh, in Acts 17. From one man, Adam, he made all nations that they should inhabit the whole earth, and he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. God did this so that they would seek him and perhaps reach out to him and find him, for he is not far from any. I just, um, you know, we need to pray fervently, and we need to ask God to give us his heart, to help us to see like he sees, and um, to not just be Minnesota nice. Mm -hmm. We're salt, we're light, we're the fragrance of Christ. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I want to have your son, Sam, come up here. Sam, would you come up here for a You weren't expecting this. But I want to pray. I want to pray for you. You're kind of representing your dad today, okay? I want, us to, I want us to stop right now and just pray. Pray for Bruce as he's in Montreal. Pray for this ministry that Julie and Bruce are leading. They're pioneering this ministry for the entire denomination, for the entire country. We're like the, we're like the, the test trial right here to see how this is going to work and what this could look like. This is, this is major stuff. This is kingdom-building things. And so I want us to pray for both Sam and Julie and Bruce, and, and so join me in prayer, would you? Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of the Lord Jesus, and we thank you. We thank you that you've called Bruce and Julie back here home, but not just to call them home, but through them you're calling us. You're speaking to us, and we want to be that inside-out follower, Jesus, who follows you when you prompt us and lead us. And I pray that you would lead and guide Bruce and Julie as they help churches like ours connect with those who are now our neighbors. God, that we would show the love of Jesus to them. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being here. I don't know that I'm going to be able to get through the sermon because I said we would. We're probably not. I want to ask Martin Marichek. He doesn't know I'm going to do this to him. Martin, come on up here. He doesn't know this. This is totally spontaneous. You're wondering what I'm going to say to you, aren't you? Hey, you are wondering. I'm going to ask you. This is interview time. This is part of the sermon. I want you to see how you can apply God's word. Talk to Julie and Bruce after, or talk to Julie and Sam after the service. They'll be in the lobby. If you want to know how to be involved in their ministry, we're not going to be able to finish the message. We'll pick it up next week. Uh, Martin, you come over here. Stand in front of this microphone. Martin is the deacon of community engagement where he is, got, you've called him as the deacon of community engagement to start figuring out how we can be involved outside of the walls of our church, into our neighborhood, into our community. And we're praying through what this is going to look like. And Martin's looking for opportunities for this. There's something that Martin showed me this week. It was a website. And this is around, you don't know, bless, it's called bless. Blessminnesota.org. Bless MN. B-L-E-S-S-M-N dot org. And it's an opportunity where you can go and pray for your street. So, or any street. 
this map, you could pick a street and say, I'm going to take responsibility for praying for this street. And then what they ask you to do is, once a month or once a week, walk up and down your street and just pray for your street. So anyway, it's a great organization, um, great idea to just uh, figure out. It also gets you out in your community to get to meet some of the people, let them know you're praying for them, and see what their needs are and see how we can show them love. Yeah, okay, so stay here. Because when, when he took me to the website this week, we looked at what this could look like. Bless Minnesota. Bless MN. Bless MN. Bless MN. And then there's a subtitle that says, Beyond Minnesota Nice. And when Julie said, you know, Beyond Minnesota Nice, it tied in. I said, Martin's got to come up here and say this. So there's going to be opportunities we're going to have to apply this passage of Scripture in our own neighborhoods, in our own part of the Twin Cities, and in the entire metro area. We're not going to finish the sermon, but we are going to sing before we leave. And so I'm going to pray again. I'm going to pray. And, and uh, while I'm praying, I would like to have the, the worship leaders come to the front for the closing song. And, uh, and then after that, um, we'll have a, a prayer of, of dismissal for the benediction. During the song, we have prayer partners who will be here at the front of the church. And if you would like prayer, please come and see them. They'd love to pray with you. Uh, let's, let's pray. Come on up here, Martin. Let's, let's pray together. Lord, we give this, this time to you. We thank you for the power of your word, the encouragement from the, the lives of, of your people in the book of Acts, that we could be inside-out followers of Jesus, that we would be seeking your Spirit's leading, that you would be doing a work among us, God, that we'd be listening and calling out issues in our own hearts so that we can be the people you want us to be. Make us white-hot worshipers of you, Jesus. So take our hearts and light them on fire with your Holy Spirit's inspiration, with the love that you have for us and for our neighbor, so that we would live that out. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we sing?